1 Corinthians chapter 1, from verse 26. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world, and things which are despised, hath God chosen. Yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this word. Help us, Lord, to take it in and to learn something we can apply. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. I'd like us to look at who God chooses. Who God chooses. See here a picture of a seven-week-old baby in the mother's womb. Seven weeks in the sense of seven weeks from conception. And this little baby can move and, and uh, have feelings. And God chooses us, even from our mother's womb. It talks of how God has got a choosing of those people that will follow him. And uh, one of the people that God chose is the nation of Israel. And there's a saying that goes, How odd of God to choose the Jews. Deuteronomy 7 verse 6, it says, Of the nation of Israel, For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. Israel was a chosen people, a people of God's own choosing. We're going to look at a few people through the history of the scriptures, through the pages of God's word, that God chose who God chooses. Another person that God chose was Abraham. God called Abraham. His family had worshipped idols. He lived in an idolatrous city, yet God chose childless Abraham and Sarah to father the nation of Israel. It seemed impossible, yet God brought a wonderful blessing through Abraham to the world. And the people that God chooses are very human. Abraham himself experienced many failures. He lied, pretending that Sarah was his sister at one time because he was weak and cowardly. Yet God called Abraham a friend of God. Here's just one example as we go through. God used Abraham. He made him the father of the Jewish race through whom all the families of the earth would be blessed. And in our text that we just read, it says that God selects people. Not many wise, not many noble, not many mighty. God has chosen the foolish things, it says, or those that are without rank, without status. God has chosen the weak things. If you're feeling weak today, God has chosen the weak things, the feeble, the base things, or the insignificant people, the despised things, those that are least esteemed, those people that the world would disregard and count as lowly or insignificant, unworthy, those that would be looked down upon. God has a place for you. He chooses you. God did not choose you and me because of our own strength, our own gifts or abilities. God chose us in a way, because of our weakness. Because of our weakness, he has chosen the weak things of the world, it says, to confound the things which are mighty. And God delights in using weak people. Isn't that a wonderful encouragement for you, for me, to think that even though I feel weak and inadequate, unworthy, unsuited, because God can showcase his power and his glory through your life, despite you, God can use you. And Oswald Chambers wrote, God comes in where my helplessness begins. We see who God chooses. And we see that, as we've talked about Abraham there, it says of him, I will make thee a great nation. A great nation. Esther is another example. An adopted Jewish girl. Yet she became the queen of Persia. God used her mightily to save the lives of of the Jewish people. Who does God choose? People just like you and me. Mr. or Mrs. Average, ordinary people of different colours and races, the regular people, the everyday kinds of people. 
Let's walk down the hall of faith today and see just a glimpse, just some little snapshots through the history of the pages of God's Word to see some of these people, these heroes of the faith, just ordinary people that God uses. One of them was Deborah. Deborah was a woman that God showed his strength through to lead the nation of Israel on the battlefield as she led God's people to victory. God can use you too. If you have a willing heart, if you have that availability, he will lead you, he will enable you, he'll equip you and train you. God can use you and he will never leave you. It's just a matter of trust. Peter is another one. Peter and Andrew were just fishermen, simple fishermen, just there minding their boats by the side of the sea. And the Lord Jesus enters in, into their lives and gets their attention. Peter was a simple man. He was unschooled, untrained in an ordinary way. He was just an average, everyday fisherman. And his critics thought of him as being an ignorant person. As we read here in Acts 4, verse 13, they saw the boldness of Peter and John and they perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men. They marveled and they took knowledge of him that they had been with Jesus. Peter became a great leader, an apostle of the church. Even though he was just a simple fisherman, he became a great vessel for God to pour himself into. What about you? What about you today? Maybe we could all take stock and think, hey, if God can use just ordinary people, and you read about them warts and all in here, don't you? All their faults and failings, you know, God's word doesn't paint a pretty picture of some of them. They are quite um, inadequate. What about you today? The devil would have you believe the lie that you can't be used of God. The devil would have you think that God cannot use you. We may think we can't be used because perhaps we have a lack of education. Perhaps we have a lack of, of the language. We feel we're too old. Too young, too poor, too unworthy. We think we're not trained enough. Yet God shows us that even through a humble fisherman who just spent time with the Lord Jesus, that was what mattered. That's what made the difference. It wasn't so much his abilities, but his availability as he stepped out of that fishing boat and followed the Master. And the person whom God uses the most it's not the most educated, or the most talented, the most gifted, the most beautiful, the most worthy. God uses average, ordinary people, just like you and me. And He is the giver of the gifts. We can rely upon His Holy Spirit, as ordinary people can do extraordinary things. And God will equip, and He'll empower you. He'll fill you with Himself, with who He is, with His great power. As we say, here am I, use me. He will equip and empower you. In Matthew 16, shortly after the Lord told Peter that he was a rock, he told Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. You know, Peter had his great failings too and made many mistakes. It shows how God really can use anybody. If God can use Peter, he can use anybody. And God's grace is extended to those who are willing to repent of their failures and sins, and to let him use them. Look at a few more ordinary people that God uses in his word. They were faulty and weak. Here's another example. Jonah. Look at Jonah and his life. What a mess he made of it. A prophet of God. God gave him a job to do, to go and preach to the nation of Nineveh, and he goes in the exact opposite direction. He ran away from the Lord. Yet God used Jonah later to bring spiritual revival to that nation. Another one is David. David, he was just an ordinary teenager, the youngest son in his family, this little shepherd boy with five stones. He only used one of them to slay a giant and save his nation. And he became the king of Israel. Yet David himself, he was very imperfect, wasn't he? David committed adultery, he had a man killed and he held his sin for over a year before God made him confess. Despite his great mistakes, scriptures tell us that David had a heart after God. 
God used him as his servant. Another one, Samson. He was a man who conquered whole armies by himself. He was a, a, a great fighter, yet he couldn't conquer his own lusts. And in the end, uh, when God brought him and humbled him low, as we see in this picture, that as a blinded man, blinded by the uh, captors, he pushed the, the temple down that they were in, the house. He brought the house down. He was used of God because God gave him that strength again. Moses is another one in the, in the Word of God. He was another lowly shepherd, just an average everyday shepherd, finding those little sheep out in the paddocks. And he had a speech impediment. He felt very inadequate. But God used him mightily, didn't he? To free the nation of Israel from the Egyptians. God spoke through him. Yet Moses <coughs> messed up too. God was so angry with Moses at one point that he wanted to kill him. In Exodus 4, verse 24. Moses failed to give God the glory once and when he struck a rock. And God didn't let him into the promised land. Yet Moses is one of the great leaders of the Old Testament having written most of it. Mary. Think of Mary. The chosen vessel for God Almighty to carry His, His Son into the world. Through an ordinary girl. Mary was just an ordinary girl. She became Mary, the mother of Jesus. Lots of girls were growing up in Nazareth when God sent His Son we can't always understand why God chooses someone as against another. Friends, now the big question, the big question, we bring it right down to you, to me today, the very big question for you and for me is what is stopping God from using you? What is stopping God from using you? Likelihood is it is you. Likelihood is, it's that face that looks you in the mirror every morning. Is the one who's stopping God from using you. Maybe you are fearful. Maybe you fear men or failure. You'll only know by stepping out in faith. Failure. Thomas Edison was one of the world's greatest geniuses, the creator of the light bulb. He failed over several hundred times as he made that light bulb that we take for granted today before he got it right. Someone asked him, how does it feel to fail that many times? And he responded by saying, they weren't failures, they were education. It's how we learn, isn't it? As you take that step forward in faith and you might make some slip-ups now and again, God will teach you and you can learn. I know I'm still very much learning as I go. And even if you failed miserably like Peter himself, God has not given up on you. God will use you again for his purposes. You know, just dust yourself off after you've fallen. It says, you know, the righteous man will fall seven times, but the Lord will lift him up. God's got a purpose for you. A plan for you. He saw you way back in your mother's womb. He knew you would be his by his grace and calling. Be like Peter and humble yourself before him. And friends, I urge you today, each one, whatever it is that God's putting on your heart, whoever you be today, I know there's different ones talking to me about their, their desire to serve the Lord. And that's a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful thing that we should nurture and nourish and we want to do that as a church and yet it can be in simple ways to serve to be available to be used of God God can take our inabilities and turn them into God abilities you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you what is stopping God from using you another example we could say is Gideon he was one 
a man hiding from his enemy, and an angel comes on the scene and tells this trembling, quaking mess of a man, he calls him a mighty man of valour. God sees what you can become through him. What stands out with people like Mary, Amos, David and Gideon is willingness. They had a willingness. If God would just help you to be willing, he will use you. I know there's different ones that have felt the Lord moving them to step out and do things they've never done before. Things that might be scary. But God will enable. God will equip. God will empower. God will lead and make the doors open in his way as he calls and moves you. And God uses the little people to do a big work because his power is greatest in those that are weak. Little people are often considered weak by the world standards <coughs> and extremely importantly, they consider themselves weak. They know they are nothing without God. Friends, if you're feeling weak, that's good. If you're feeling like you can't do it, that's good because it's He who does the work, isn't it? He is the one who works in us both to will and to do of His good pleasure. Just let Him have His way with you. Let Him have His way with you. Friends, and just to close, God takes the nobodies and He fills them with power. And just lastly, you think about the universe. Think about the extent, the extremity of who God is in the wonder of creation. As the heavens declare the glory of God, as you see, there's many beautiful pictures from such telescopes as the Hubble Space Telescope, where you can see these beautiful pictures that God has painted in the heavens of His glory. And it says in our text that no flesh should glory in His presence. In 1 Corinthians 1, verse 29, that no flesh should glory in His presence. When you're feeling weak and inadequate, that's when God can use you to the full, as you depend upon Him. As it says in that earlier one, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Here's a load of clay pots. God puts His glory into clay pots. Isn't that wonderful? They don't have to be particularly snazzy or, or ornate or particularly outstanding in their value or their shape. They're just a vessel. You're just a vessel in the potter's hand. You're just a, an instrument, a container for God. And He wants to fill you, to fill you, to fill you with Himself. And friends, it can happen. And as He does that, we'll find that no flesh will glory in His presence. We want to give God all the glory for what He has done, for how He's led us as a church, for our future as He leads the way forward that God will have the glory. We have this treasure, this treasure, this earthen, in these earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. As it says too in that text that we read, Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us, wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, redemption. He is all in all. He is our righteousness. It's not of our own endeavour, it's letting Him have His way with you. He is our righteousness. He is our justification. He is our sanctification, our holiness. He is our redemption, our salvation. It's based solely on Him and what He has done. And yet, of course, we must, as it says, work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. There's a twofold sense where God works in you and we are to work uh, in response to that. But always that we give God the glory for whatever He does, for however He uses us, however insignificant it may seem. Be that vessel, be His hand extended.